guys tuning in, thank you so much for participating in 1455's second annual Summer Literary Festival. We hope you will help us spread awareness by sharing your impressions via social media, liking the 1455 Facebook page, and signing up for our newsletter. Welcome to Street Poets, live typewritten art. Street poetry is a first draft as final draft form of performing art. Um, and, and maybe some of the poets will, will disagree a little bit on my interpretations here, but I, the way that I would define street poetry, personalized poems are created within minutes for strangers on the street or at events or over live stream based off of a topic, story, or idea. And this is almost always done with a manual typewriter, like my old brother Opus 888 here. The first thing I want to say before I roll into this panel is that these four poets are really amazing poets, not possibly represent the entirety of our genre. Um, there are so many other talented poets who may even be watching now that I wish I could have also been included. Frankly, it would take an entire conference, wink, and hours of conversation to truly get at the heart of what we do. We also hope you'll dig deeper into the work of our authors. Some of their books are available for purchase via the links on the agenda page for the Lit Fest website. 1455 is delighted to be partnering with the Potter's House on book sales this year. They are a nonprofit bookstore, cafe, and event space in Washington, DC. However, these poets primarily support their art by creating and accepting compensation for on-the-spot poems. During the presentation, I'll be sharing social media and website information on how you can request poems from these poets. We hope to make this session as interactive as possible. So use the chat room to submit questions, tell us where you're from, and to applaud our poets, share remarks and ideas, and even eventually request poetry, we will be taking one request during this session and demonstrating what street poetry looks like live. Without further ado, our poets are going to introduce themselves via our shared medium, which is poetry. Each of these poets have amazing and impressive CVs, and I think that everybody watching should definitely take the time to read them. It definitely makes my head spin and is inspiring for me how much art these poets have created and participated in. However, as street poets, we know that verse can speak volumes. Without delay, let's meet our poets. So I want to start with you, uh, Matilda, and it's a, it's a little bit of a, uh, um, uh, of a of sort of just kind of like, I'm excited for the, your, you to start because the poem that you wrote was actually one that you wrote for me. And um, it really actually helped shape my journey as a writer when you wrote it. Um, and tell me, and when you share your poem, when everybody kind of goes around and shares their poems, Tell me a little bit about why this poem means a lot to you um, as a street poet or as a writer in general. So Matilda, why don't you kick us off? Hello. Uh, thank you for having me here. Appreciate this. Um, yeah, like uh, Joseph said, this was one that I wrote for him in October. We mm -hmm. were at Herman's, which for people who may not be in the typewriter community is a very large, I think the largest uh, typewriter museum, if in the States, not just the world, I, or other way around, whatever. Um, so every year, now twice a year, because it's so big, um, there's a gathering there. And that's where I was able to meet Joseph. Um, just he kind of popped in beside me. I recognized him from Instagram and uh, we gave each other topics and wrote each other poems. And this is, uh, I can't remember exactly what the topic was that Joseph gave me, but this is what we came up with. And it's rising over redundancy. With the storming of the electronic, we lose our identity, identity with serendipity, destroying spirituality embracing pressurized conformity. Take up banner, arms, or with the ones next door. We cannot let them get us down, man. It is a far cry from recognizing the impression we make in our footsteps. Press hard on that mechanism, the linkages pulling and straining. We crush against the force of iron and ink, engraving the essence of our depression against the veins of natural fibers. Tear apart the fabric of boredom with the weapon of choice, of loaded ammunition, of loaded premonition. Machines brought to life with bone and blood of the critic turned writer. We grasp for the lost, the stolen, 
taking back our lives word by word, key by key, line by line, falling out of line, falling out of love with the swallowed pill, stuck in the craw, as we reach to the end of the line, but we are the ones who have the release, who can press hard, advance with confidence, and believe our words will resonate, fly further than the void, and bring the message of revolution. So. Thank you so much for sharing that. <laughs> thank you. I, I like I, um, I, we had communicated just a few days ago. I reread this poem and I was like, I wrote this. <laughs> and in sort of the way that it resonated for you, um, it's now resonating for me as well in, in the times that we're in. And it's kind of a kick in a butt for me as well. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, as Benjamin Alishire said, viva la revolution. We, it, the typewriter <laughs> revolution is actually, is definitely a thing. And it is so, it's so cool to see these machines, which are, which, which kind of like put themselves into all of like, you know, kind of writing culture in general. We'll maybe get to talk about that a little later um, as symbols actually become functional again. Um, I, so next I want to introduce Brian Sonia Wallace, who is uh, just, Awesome. He's, he is, uh, he goes by Rent Poet on Instagram. He is recently releasing a new book uh, entitled The Poetry of Strangers. And so he has just a whole host of poems at his disposal to be able to share. So I'm, I'm curious to see what he chooses tonight. Um, welcome, Brian, and share some poetry. Let me unmute myself. That'll help. Thank you so much, Joseph. Um, really excited to be here and to be part of this conversation. Um, so yeah, I just came out with a book of essays, which was interesting as a way of digging back into the poems and trying to sort of do archaeology on them and find the stories in them. So I'm going to share a little bit of the backstory to this poem uh, and then share the poem. Um, this is a poem that was written in quarantine um, a bit over a month ago for someone who reached out online and had two kids both graduating, uh, someone, one of them graduating from high school, one of them graduating from college uh, in this year when all graduations are virtual and everything is virtual and we are virtual. Um, so this poem is virtual, but it um, I, I think speaks to both the anxieties of kind of coming, coming of age in this moment, um, which are, are echoed, I think, in some ways in my own uh, journey to being a typewriter poet and its uh, relationship to my dubious relationship to employment. Um, and so uh, without further ado, this is for Ben. Global. It means something different now. A graduation shifted, world shared and shattered. And in London and Tokyo, in Dubai and in Minnesota, snow and thaw, our indoor selves flex against borders, find they are flimsy, man-made things. Choose family instead. Choose home-cooked meals and no personal space. Choose whatever you want, and know we'll be here to support every step of the way. After the hard summer, when we seal the cracks, let it be in gold, kintsugi, a reverence that does not pretend nothing is broken. Welcome to history, new graduate. We cannot know how the world will look. All we know is there is a place for you in it. Your uncertainty, your generosity, the liquid metal between them. When in doubt, mend. We'll see new shores again. Good morning, sun, to the new day as it's breaking. Wow, that was that was awesome. The the our indoor cells flex against borders. I I just I think that the the pandemic has been both. So as we had even discussed on, on live Instagram, uh, when at the start of it, it is, it is at points been inspiring and at points been very struggling as, as artists. And I've heard both sides. Um, but the, 
the metaphor, I, I, the with Kansugi, is that that's when when the when the dish breaks and the, the cracks are filled with the gold. Oh, it's yeah, it's the it's a, a Japanese technique in repairing um, usually like old pottery. Um, and one of the cool things that happens so often with these poems is I didn't know um, I all of the correspondence around this poem happened over email. And so after I sent the poem in, um, the woman who I was writing for said, you can't have known this, but I'm actually Japanese. Wow. Yeah, there there is um, a, a sense of intuning that comes with being a street poet that I've, I've had people challenge me on and both point <laughs> out. I, I don't, it's not a, I don't brag about it because I don't want people to know because then more people are going to say, hey, write a poem about this and that. And they're going to try to get me to predict it. But it is, it is wonderful that, that that ended up happening in that occurrence. Um, I want to call to the stage um, Marshall James Cavanaugh, who is Dream Poet for Hire, and he uh, types in, in, uh, in Philadelphia at Rittenhouse Square. He's done some awesome projects, both in terms of COVID-19, as well as uh, responding to the uh, George Floyd protests with uh, care and compassion. Um, I'm really excited to have him be part of this as well. So Marshall, welcome. What poem did you bring for us today? Hey, how's it going, everyone? Um, so yeah, I'm Dream Poet for Hire, based in Philly. Um, and yeah, I guess uh, I, I brought a poem about the dream poet. Um, for me, poetry is definitely a way to um, bridge the worlds and like merge uh, dreams into this one or this one into a dream world. Um, I think, you know, putting a person out with a hat and a typewriter, it's kind of like this dreamy, um, shocking, maybe, uh, performance piece that um, seems to really invite a lot of inspiration and, uh, I don't know, really, really like open people up in this cool way. Um, but yeah, here's about the dream poet, um, a typewritten poem for all of you at home. Uh, Rising up amongst the streets of the East, a call to spring further and outwards, chasing experience, beyond the current constellation of stars, finding words to meet the story brewing, homage to literary giants bef from before me, a punk rock attitude of do it yourself and making it work. A dream poet is born, bridging the worlds of subconscious realm, crafting spells out of rhyme and meter, every line upon the antique keys, a rattle and drum to make the dream so real. Um, so yeah, it was a little piece I wrote from last year about, you know, being a, a poet for hire or a uh, person doing poetry in public places. Oh, that, that is awesome. The, the, the rattle and hum of, of typewriters. There's the sound of a typewriter on the street is, is oftentimes what I feel like gets the most, like gets that conversation started, that initial moment of what is that thing? And somebody, a lot of people, I get a lot of, oh, my mother and my father used to have one of those. It's just so it's 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 different, and it 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 definitely does seem like it comes from another world. Uh, thank you so much for sharing. And then Benjamin Alishire, welcome so much to the panel. It is so great to have you here. Um, and and uh, as as I have had mentioned on on Instagram when I shared everybody's bios, uh, your 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 depth and breadth of knowledge about our genre is is really what what has deeply impressed me about your work. But what poem bro, did you want to share today? What what poem speaks to you and is special to you in your collection? Um, I thought I would read this this one. It's called Fake News. It's the, the title of a manuscript that I'm working on. The story behind it is um, that uh, there was like a local TV thing that was interviewing me and um, they were like, oh, we're getting B-roll. Uh, why don't you write me a poem? And I said, well, what do you want it to be about? And he said, Oh, it doesn't matter. It, it, it's not even just just write anything, anything. And so I said, "Well, how about the news?" You know, and uh, he's like, "Great, great." Um, and I've been thinking a lot about fake news uh, and its effect on everything that's happening now. Uh, so I wrote I wrote him this. It's called Fake News. My smartphone is a nesting doll, suspiciously heavy and rattling faintly like a SARS saber sheathed. Something doesn't add up. I open her like a jam jar, find Henry Kissinger head scarfed and peasant skirted, clutching his Nobel 
peace prize, but I pop him like a Bud Light. And then Putin glistens, bare-breasted. I twist his hips apart, and that's when it happened. It was like a farm spilling out. It was a like farm. So many emperors in that circus giving me a thumbs up, the sound of one hand clapping. I had so much consent manufactured, my applause was deafening. Now I can do anything, even speak French. Listen, alternative fact, pas de de, non de guerre. Coup de ta. La la la. <laughs> and then they cut it out of the segment, which I'm almost not surprised. <laughs> <laughs> that was the, the reactions. I was watching the reactions as you were reading the poem, and it was it was it was <laughs> amazing. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know if there are any kids watching, but what in the comment section we have effing brilliant <laughs> as the response to that. <laughs> oh my goodness, this is so. Oh, that was Can so. We not swear? Can we not swear? Or? I, I don't actually know. I didn't check that one, but um, I I don't know. <laughs> but I I guess it would be fine. Maybe 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 one of Zuckerberg the might might shut us down. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Get get a uh, censored. Well, if one of the moderators wants to let us know if we can we can swear, that'd be great. But we have a lot of uh, comments from people that were that were listening um, that that they just love the lines of everybody's poems. Um, the, one of the attendees said that they're glad they're muted because they're making sounds while all these poems are being shared, gasping, applauding, and commenting. So thank you so much. And I, I don't, I didn't ask for street poems, but I, I know that probably at least one or two of these, I know uh, Matilda's was, were written on the spot, first draft to final draft um, performances, which is really awesome. So I want to, so again, this is a, a really interesting and unique form of art. And I want to just kind of dive into the conversation with, with the question on inspiration. Uh, that's a question that kind of not only tackles where did you come from as a street poet, but why do you continue to come as a street poet? What brings you back to that uh, place of, of, you know, connecting with people, being on the street, being at events? Um, and part of why I wanted to start with you, Benjamin, on this question was because, uh, again, your interview with Rodrigo Toscano and Big Other was what, um, you know, I was, you shared that to the, to the Street Poets Instagram group, and I just went, whoa, look at what this guy knows, and look at the, the history. I had picked up a typewriter, and I was like, I want to try poetry. And that was, so my, my background, I had done poetry before, but trying it with people in the public square was something that I didn't even have a knowledge of that background for. So what brought you to street poetry and what brings you back to street poetry, Benjamin? And anybody else, if you hear something he says, just jump in. This is a great thing about a panel is it's a conversation and, and, a, and just sharing and, and meshing those ideas. Um, yeah, thanks. And yeah, I guess, well, what brought me to it is, um, I think I talked about it a little bit in that interview, but I, I, especially when I was younger, I was, I was trying to juggle a few different art forms. You know, I was, I'd say I was primarily a musician. I was touring with bands um, and also doing theater and doing visual art. And uh, uh, so with the band, uh, we were, um, you know, we would tour and stuff, but, it, but we could make more money in the street uh, than we could at these clubs, you know, because um, we weren't at the point where we could demand high, you know, uh, payment or something like that. So a club might give us a couple hundred bucks, but we might make 600 bucks in the street outside the club before uh, the show. So, you know, uh, there, was, there was that element. And then in the background of that, I was writing poetry kind of in a non-academic way because I, I come from like a low-income family where no one went to college. I didn't go to college. Um, so it's sort of like a non-academic. Sometimes I feel in poetry, there's like, there's like academic poetry and then there's like the kind of uh, the gutter, the street, there's a lot of like tropes there and everything. 
Um, and so typewriter poetry fits really well into there. I mean, using poetry as busking is a pretty natural move. Um, I had this friend, Robert McKay, who did it not as a business really, but as kind of like a more in the vein of like the surrealist games and the Dadas games and stuff. Um, and so I would hire him for events because I used to run a small press, like a small letterpress press. Um, and we would throw poetry, you know, wine drinking, poetry reading type, type things, you know? And so he'd be there writing poems for people. Um, and at first I didn't think I could do it. Uh, I thought it was like, he was this magical creature. Um, but eventually an ex-girlfriend sort of shamed me into doing it. She was like, what are you afraid? You know, and I realized I was afraid, you know? And so I, so I tried it and that, that it just kind of, you know, went from there, you know? I got a stall at the farmer's market. That was kind of how it took off. Cause then uh, there's all these people at the farmer's market. I got like press coverage, all these things. I was like, oh wow, I could kind of do this, you know? Yeah. Uh, the, it's funny you mentioned the ex-girlfriend because my, my wife is actually the one that, that suggested the idea at first to me. Oh, yeah. So it's a, cool. the, the real secret of the big, um, uh, of the walking wall poet, which is not a big thing, but that it actually came from my wife first. So we have to, I, I have to be grateful and thankful to my significant other. It's interesting you mentioned Robert K as, as kind of a surrealist. Um, and, and I'd like to bump the question over to Marshall because I know, as you mentioned in the beginning, uh, Marshall, dreams and the, the concept of, of a little bit of that surreal is very present in your work as a street poet. So Marshall, what kind of inspires you as you are um, writing on the street? What brought you originally there? And uh, tell us a little bit about your history as a poet. Yeah, sure. Um, I mean, yeah, definitely with surrealism, I've always enjoyed like the exquisite corpse uh, style, like, you know, filling it, each, each poet grabs a line and, you know, throws something into the poem and then the next person grabs the page and they write something and then you have this crazy uh, organism that forms out of a, you know, this mess of words. Um, I, think, I think doing like practices like that at home and with friends and going out to the bar and getting drunk and like being like, let's write poetry has definitely influenced me to be a poet and like be able to jump outside of like, okay, everything I, I write needs to be like perfect. It needs to be like, in that moment, just like exactly what was requested of me. Um, I, I think it's like, I guess, yeah, I mean, it, for me, it's definitely like dreams, but also like emotions and like the heart. And um, I think the heart doesn't always have, uh, have to be like perfectly phrased. It's more about getting that like essence of like what's going on for you. Um, I think the thing that's really kept me in the street as a, as a street poet is, um, uh, just there, there's like all these like cathartic moments that happen between you and the person who's coming up for a poem. I've definitely been in like places where, um, you know, a person comes up and we've never met before and uh, they ask for a poem about uh, like a, a parent or like a child who, who's passed on or, um, or maybe it's a teenager and they come up and ask about a poem about suicide, you know, and, and there's no, no, I mean, sometimes there is more of a discussion, but sometimes there isn't. Sometimes there's just like, okay, how does that make us feel? You know, how can we like connect on this as two humans, you know, two people who don't know each other, but definitely feel a lot all the time. And um, I, th I think that's where like, I, I find like, like an abundance of value of doing this practice of being like available, almost like a, um, I mean, this is in my, my way of describing, it. I feel like a lot of us talk about it as being like an open channel. So it's like the poets in the street, uh, he's open 20, well, like, I don't know, there should be a 24 seven poet, but he's not there 24 seven, but he might be, you might find him out there, go seek him out. And then like, um, there, it's almost like, it's not advice. It's not, it's not, um, it's not like telling people what to do. It's not like, hey, like this is gonna be okay. It's like, hey, we feel things. And like, here are some words to like move through that and feel that heartbeat and really get like excited. And, and then, yeah, I always try to, I'm a dream poet. So I try to put a positive twist at the end of like, like just like, you feel it? <laughs> I don't know. But I think that's like, uh, the catharsis is what inspires me. I think it's, it's really special to be able to connect with people through a poem. That's awesome. Yeah, I, um, I, th I thinking about the, the feeling aspect of it, and like you've talked about some of the really weighty topics that have come forward, 
I, I have found that even for myself, when I've written for myself or written for um, other people, that there is a sort of, I, 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 dare, to, I dare to call it therapy um, sometimes through the poems, through the art that is created on the street. Uh, because like, uh, you know, I've, I've been to a therapist, you know, I'm, I'm not ashamed to, to admit it, but the, like when you go to therapy, sometimes you can kind of just get into this wonky of how do you feel? Oh, you should stop feeling that way. You should kind of work through these feelings or something. But, but we are, we're artistic beings by nature in, in, many, in many ways. So I think that a lot of times that poetry on the street can provide a sort of catharsis as art that isn't necessarily present in, um, uh, in more clinical setting. Uh, kind of speaking, though, to kind of really getting in touch with a lot of people, uh, Brian, tell us a little bit about how you got started with poetry and how you kind of see yourself inspired today. <laughs> I see myself as a ferret in a drain pipe. Um, I got started. It, it's cool to see all the similarities in, in the ways that folks started. I definitely started as a little bit of a, an artistic mutt. And I think that this practice is very much interdisciplinary. Um, I really started in participatory theater and I think about what we do a lot as um, a scene as much as it is a poem or an artifact. So I think of it really as a, a scene and an artifact from that scene that people get to take away. And the, both of those are, I think, an art form um, in their own right. And um, in terms of starting out, yeah, I. I it's interesting, Benjamin, because we've talked a couple of times online, but not necessarily at length or, or in person, because um, I feel like I have the opposite background, where my entire family are academics. They're all like policy wonks. Um, and so I kind of did what I needed to, but knew that I didn't want to continue down that path. And... Um, was doing grant writing for nonprofits and was doing a lot of different uh, social justice work and performance work on the side and um, had an invitation to do something on the street uh, at a, a street fair and had heard a story on the radio about someone doing this weird thing with a typewriter. So it was really serendipitous um, that it, it happened. Um, and it, it took about two more years um, until I was unemployed and, and job hunting and went, okay, let me see if I can actually um, do this in a, in a way where I have a, a goal beyond having these interactions where I actually have a financial goal. Um, and that's kind of given rise to the more business end of what I do. And it's been really interesting with this practice to see the way that it is um, appealing in some ways to the, you know, like, um, Ben, you talked about, you know, running a magazine and hiring a typewriter poet to come to events and that sort of stuff happens, but also the ways that it's appealing to weddings and tech companies and real estate firms and investment bankers and all of these weird pockets of accumulated wealth that then as a poet, you can sort of leech uh, onto. Um, I think we're going strong with the animal metaphors this evening. And then I think you, you had asked sort of how I see myself, Joseph, and I think that's an interesting question because I, I um, through starting in street poetry now actually also teach poetry and spoken word. Um, I just finished a book of essays and I'm teaching my first nonfiction class. Um, I did like an environmental management degree in college. It was not the it was not a writing track. Um, and so I feel like a, a, so much of the time I'm just playing catch up. I'm like playing catch up across every art form of writing and doing a lot of reading and doing a lot of meeting people and thinking and, and um, sort of feeling around the edges um, of different things. But I think that typewriter poetry has just been a core of all of those practices. And it's so much uh, an avenue into everything else and into even like some of the journalism work that I've done recently. So much of that starts with uh, writing poems for people or, or interviewing people in a way that comes from having you know eight years of writing poems for people under my belt so that's um i think as close as i'm going to get to an answer for that question it is definitely a, a big question to, to to kind of take in that self-view and try to look at all the things that we are we are doing and creating and writing and just and and creating in general too because even when we're you know kind of teaching or going outside that realm of poetry that's that's a form of of manifesting something kind of into the world. Um, so uh, Matilda, it's, it's interesting because uh, 
you know, uh, uh, because Brian talked about kind of poetry at the core. And one of the things that you and I have discussed a little bit and also is kind of present in your, in your bio is how you've actually come, um, do you have a lot of other art forms, writing art forms and, and type, you know, kind of typewriter based, you know, thinking and thought and, and creativity. Uh, tell us a little bit about how you kind of um, got, in, how you got inspired as a poet and what work you've done and what kind of interests you and intrigues you about the genre. Um, well, I'm, I come more, yeah, from the novel writing, short story writing, essayist background, um, which is how I got into the typewriter work because the computer screen was just killing me. And I found the media of the typewriter and I found it so much easier um, to actually be able to sit down and write and finish something, which was the biggest thing. I had to finish something. Um, poetry came around, you know, like any good teenager, I wrote all the good angsty stuff. Um, and then, you know, you hit college, university in your 20s and you kind of get away from it because that's just what the kids did. Um, but then I started kind of when I, when, I, when I got into the typewriter community, I started finding people who were actually using the typewriters like Brian and Marshall um, out there with people and being, a, I would say, an extreme anti, uh, not, um, introvert. Uh, I had, I, I collected way too many <laughs> typewriters. So I had all of them. Um, and I moved back home to Canada and I was kind of like, what am I going to do with all of these? So in order to kind of get back into my own community um, of my small town, I took the influence of the people I was following on Instagram and I told myself to just get out there, take the typewriter, um, get back to poetry and take the challenge of just having to talk to people <laughs> um and, and i actually I, I i found that i was spending more time talking about the typewriters than i was writing poetry which was fine for me because i could do that all day um so the poetry has been a real challenge um just i don't I, it's 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 hard to describe sorry no, that's that. I, I think that that really, you know, there there's there's something to say about kind of approaching the art as a a, a new voice in terms mm -hmm. like from the novelist and typewriter side, and and when you you know it, it, we it it's it's a it was such a discovery when I started to kind of see my how poetry was shaped by the street poetry and how mm -hmm. street poetry shaped me in general that that. It's it takes the poetic form, which obviously, as 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 everybody has been commenting very generously as, as answers to some of the comment to the questions that have been put in the chat. Um, poetry is not street poetry is not a, by the, by any means a limit to what we create, even as poets and other types of poetry. So uh, and it's so cool to see how it informs though how our art uh, definitely makes me a little more disciplined and focused as a writer. I think uh, being able to get more familiar with the machines as well has really helped um yeah and getting and getting focused with other people and how they're seeing stuff because my biggest thing it wasn't so much the poetry it was really talking to the people like you know anybody can throw out a penny uh you know a, a dime topic here and there but I would sit and I would talk with the people about the topic for about a good 10 minutes before I'd even start writing um, so for me, it was getting to know the people and it was getting to know stories behind the people, which is the big thing. It, every poem is a story and it's a story for that specific person. Um, and, and that's what you have to get over yourself and over your ego. It's not about you. It, it's about them. It's not the teenager angst anymore. It's about their, them telling you and trusting you to give back to them their story in a form that they would never otherwise have wanted or guessed or 
uh, appreciated. Um, so that for me, that's what poetry was. And the typewriter is what helped me get out there and do it for them because you could, you could take it out there. You can't take a computer out onto the street corner or sitting in front of the bookstore and type and print, you know, you, you can't, and handwriting is, there's just, it's almost too personal. Whereas the typewriter is that nice piece, kind of an anti-barrier between you and that other person and that story coming to you through and back to them. So yeah, for me, that's what poetry is to me. Yeah, it's awesome. Um, let's talk a little bit about the typewriters. I know I'm shifting up a little bit of the order of things, but we've definitely gotten some questions about um, buying machines, things like that. Uh, the typewriters are definitely um, kind of are part of what make the genre so intriguing. Um, a lot of people probably still use typewriters in private to create poems, but the public expression of a big rattling tin can of levers and knobs and gears uh, is is really something that intrigues everybody. I you know I, I before COVID I would flip the typewriter around when children would come up and they would just start poking at the keys. Um, tell me so. Uh, and and Matilda, well, I'll start with you on this because you name your typewriters, and <laughs> that was that was something that always um, that that intrigued me as a collector. Um, tell me a little bit about Walter. Yes, the infamous Walter, um, who just happens to be right here. This is Walter. Hi, Walter. <laughs> <laughs> Walter is a 1929 Remington Portable Two. When I found him, he was a mess. He basically didn't work. Um, the platen, which for those who don't know, the platen is the rubber part that the paper goes on, uh, was all cracked. The paper bale was completely fused and this was all rust all the way down. So he was a little project for me. Um, a little. <laughs> a little, <laughs> a three month project. But I got him up and working, and the the name Walter comes from because he's he's a grumpy old man, and if anybody knows the ventriloquist uh, Jeff Dunham and his uh, Walter, um, that's where the name comes from. Um, and yes, they all have all forty eight of them have names. Wow. So. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, they're just, um, for me, the collecting of them, just, it, it became an obsession. Uh, luckily, the, this last year, the obsession has kind of dulled down because there's nowhere to look for them in my small town, and I refuse to go on eBay, um, mm. which which is the big place to go. But as I told someone else on here a little while earlier, it's overpriced. The The prices of typewriters are growing extramentally um, due to popularity and media. Uh, so I highly recommend going to antique shops, play on a typewriter, make sure that it works, unless you're looking for a project, um, which I did specifically for Walter, I was looking for a project. Um, so be careful, be, care be careful when you, you, you're buying, especially online, because it's, it's, it's just a picture. I've been burned twice on uh, online purchases um, and it hurts, <laughs> especially if it's your first one. So yeah, I totally recommend going to the antique store. Yeah, don't don't buy online just because. Yeah. Go out there and hunt, that's what we, go hunting. Shipping is, shipping is also a, a, a nightmare. Oh, <laughs> yes, yeah, if, you, if you're not buying from somebody, if you're buying from somebody who, you know, it's coming from an estate sale and they're just cleaning things out of the house, they have no clue how to pack a typewriter properly and it is tricky. So that, and you find horror stories on Facebook uh, groups of people getting their typewriters and they're just destroyed. So yeah, I, I highly just, buy in person if you can. There's lots of places that you can do that. So, yeah, yeah. So, I love the way that, that you described the, the hurt of like a typewriter catfishing. Um. Yes, <laughs> yes, oh my oh, yeah, gosh. It is. Yeah, um, I had a video sent to me of uh, a typewriter 
that worked great. It was no problem. And then I get the typewriter and it skipped super bad. And I realized when I compared the video to the typewriter, one was an arrow and one was a, a, a quiet deluxe. And I mean, they're so close. You cannot tell. And the video was just a slight blur. Yeah. How, how dare they? How dare they? <laughs> It was bad. It was bad. Yeah. So, oh, yeah. That's so awesome. I'll share. This is the Remington. It was not awesome. No. <laughs> no. The story is awesome, though. The fact that that's a thing that exists in this world in the year 2020. Typewriter catfishing. <laughs> we have to. We have to have uh, apps for our typewriters and make them all profiles. <laughs> Well, there we do on typewriter database. You can upload all of them and and with their serial numbers and everything. So, yeah, and you can actually, if if you are into it and someone is selling it, if they have a profile, you can check it out. So, yeah, that helps. But yeah, Brian, tell me a little bit about your collection. I got I got a quick breeze through it when we had our Instagram live. There were just typewriters lying around and, and they're all rips and crannies, which is something that I'm used to as well. But tell me a little bit about about your about your 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 typewriter, what you usually use to write, and how you've connected with the machine. Sure, I I do not name my typewriters, but I have a, a group in LA called Moto's Poetry Bureau, and and pretty much I think at least two of the other members are adamant typewriter namers. I'm always like, it's a machine, it's a tool, it's an extension. It'd be like naming your hand or like your elbow. Um, for me. Um, <laughs> Matilda's face. I don't know if y'all can see it or if you're just on speaker view, but I'm getting some some good reactions. <laughs> uh, in quarantine, I've mostly been using this Remington Rand, uh, which is just a great machine. I actually have, I feel like there's a, a huge typewriter kind of loan network. Like I'm sitting on about 10 typewriters from a friend who was out of town a while ago and said, can you watch these for me? And then has not picked them up since. Um, and then I have, I think, four or five typewriters out because uh, I got a first um, corporate event in Zoom World, and so was able to to bring a number of friends on, and a, a few of them didn't have their own typewriters, and so I lent them out typewriters for that, um, and and they're still with those people. So my typewriters are scattered across the the greater Los Angeles area, and some of them are some of them are children, and some of them are stepchildren, and some of them are distant cousins, and we're not sure how they got here, and they're broken, <laughs> but. Um, you know, we, we take them in and love them anyway. <laughs> it's like you're seeding typewriters out into the world and, and people are bringing them back to you. It's like a... I hope so. I think about half of our work is probably typewriter advocacy. I imagine more people buy typewriters after having an interaction with a typewriter poet. That That's probably true. I feel like I'm inflating the local market here. Um, and so uh, speaking of capitalism, that was a joke, Benjamin. Um, I would love to know what your, um, <laughs> what your typewriter is because you're the, you're actually, because I've, I've met uh, Brian's typewriters. I've met Marshall's typewriter. I haven't met yours yet. <laughs> Migliore, lettera 22. Oh, there you go. <laughs> Whenever uh, an, Italian, an Italian man of a certain generation will cross the street running and run up to me. The reason I, I don't speak Italian, like, uh, but there's so many Italian men have, have come up to me like, let the 22, you know, <laughs> it's kind of uh, hilarious. That's like my, that's like kind of my street workhorse because it's so small mm -hmm. and because it has like pan European um, punctuation, which is really helpful because I tour in Europe a lot, you know? Yeah. Um, and uh, then I usually have like, I have an office one too, a big one that I <laughs> just sits on a desk, you know? So right now I have a uh, Triumph. Uh, that my girlfriend got me for my birthday, which is a tank. Um, and that's sort of like the super pared down situation because I've just been so nomadic recently, but um, times when I have not been so nomadic, I've had uh, the sickness, um, uh, me and some other <laughs> typewriter people used to call it. Which is where, you know, you you just kind of, they just sort of stick to you and you suddenly have so many. Um, so I've kind of bought and sold them over the years and fixed them up a little bit and, you know. Um, but right now I'm, I'm down to uh, two, I think, yeah. I, the Triumph is one of the, the, the best I've heard as in terms of typewriter brands. I don't know what, what era you have, but it... It's intense, man. I had to, you know, 
because it was birthday present. So I was like, oh my God, baby, you got me this amazing typewriter. And then there's like this really Nazi looking eagle on it. And I'm just oh, like, yeah. oh, <laughs> so I had to look it up and it's, it's pre-Nazi. It's like Weimar Republic, you mm -hmm. know, this kind of exciting, uh, I don't want to bore everybody. There's this whole, you know, like triumph. Like they moved from Germany to the UK and so, some of them made motorcycles and some of them made typewriters. Like they, they, had, a, they had a falling out and, you know. Oh, no. Um, there, there, there is a, um, uh, if, you, if, you, if anybody checks out something called the Austin Typewriter Inc. podcast, there's a, there's a bunch of guys on there that have, that have had real deep conversations about how uh, Nazi Germany affected the massive German typewriter industry. Wow. Um, and, cool. and, uh, yeah. So, um, yeah. Yeah. And, and Marshall, uh, tell us a little bit about your machines and what you use. You have mentioned that you use a Skywriter in your, um, in your bio, which I think is fitting for, for dreams and, and. Yeah, like we got a uh, Smith Corona. Uh, so for the times, you know, uh, mm -hmm. writing uh, viral poems on the streets. Um, I, I think the Skywriter is a really nice model. It fits into this like little tiny traveler case. Um, I've, I've flown across the country with like a bunch of times and it's always fun with the TSA, but it's, it's super light. Um, when I travel like that, I'm usually a backpacker. So I'm just like got my backpack and like hitching rides and it's, it works. So, um, but then it's not the best, uh, it's not the most beautiful machine. So I actually also have a Olivetti Lettera 32. Um, the interesting thing with that is, uh, it was handed to me and in, in Taos, New Mexico, which is one of the places I type poems in. Um, and it was like gifted in this way of like, this was, you know, uh, my mother's typewriter it's uh, uh she was a writer and i want someone to, to use it you know i don't want it to just sit in the attic and collect dust um and uh yeah i don't know it's definitely haunted that's the the beautiful thing about typewriters they all have stories that precede like the current writers that uh inhabit them um they uh you know they th they have their own voice and i think it's the writer's like chance to be like you know connecting into that wherever that voice is coming from Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. And and I think we talked a little bit on one of our live streams or video chats or something about kind of the, the, the potentially, or it could have been someone else, I get my people mixed up, but the potentially haunted nature and the, and the spirit inside the typewriters. Um, and, and the fact that, um, you know, these typewriters definitely do carry the spirit of the writers that have gone before them. And the one thing that I ask every time I get a typewriter is who, who did this typewriter belong to? What was its story? and and tell me more and and so as i don't get to do that as much with the antique stores but i do get to do it when i'm uh trolling facebook marketplaces i was doing yesterday buying three different machines so um well i actually want to start with you also with marshall on this one um so covid19 definitely uh affected all of our work as street poets um i think i i i've either spoken to each of you or listened to each of your stories uh it, it changed, you know, being a outdoor in-person performing artist uh, is in some ways very incompatible, but also sometimes find some unique ways to get around the challenge of, of quarantine and shutdown. Uh, you and I, Marshall, we were, we actually did some magic manifestations over Instagram, which I thought was such a creative way to be able to, to try to, to lift spirits and to share stories during the um, during the pandemic, and you helped organize them, and I helped participate, which was was so much fun. Tell me a little bit about how you saw yourself as a creator during uh, COVID nineteen, and also a little bit about how you saw yourself as a creator as things kind of changed over to the George Floyd protests as well. Sure, yeah. Um, so Magic Manifestations, as Joseph was saying, was just like you know simply a live stream on Instagram that happened. Um, sometimes like five times a week during quarantine. Um, and yeah, it was fun. It was like collaboration with a bunch of different artists that I've worked with in person, um, like over the years, uh, spread out throughout the country um, with the, I not all of them typewriter poets. Some of them uh, were like illustrators. Some of them were like uh, musicians, uh, even had like a puppet show at one point. 
Um, and then, yeah, I don't know. The idea was like, you know, this is like a time of social distance, but like, what does a street typewriter do when everyone's like socially distant? I mean, the main thing we do is like, like break that social distance and bring us closer to each other. And then all of a sudden we're like, oh my gosh, I might have the virus. I can't, I can't connect. Like, how do I connect? Um, yeah, so I mean, it, it definitely, I think like staring into like a black mirror is, is maybe not as, um healing or like uh rejuvenating as like uh being in person and live with people and being in that moment um but yeah it was it was wild what we did i mean um so me and joseph did poems for people and you know again it, it serves us for that moment in time people are dealing with the quarantine blues and they got these live poets who can take take their requests and turn it into some magical thing um but then there was like all the i mean I don't know, in the streets, there's all this magic that happens. Uh, somehow we were, we, were, we were messing with those algorithms and creating like all this like feedback loop of like uh, just weird synchronicities and really cool uh, language usage and um, lots of like inspiration, lots of like, yo, we're, we're gonna get through this. We're gonna see each other again soon, you know? I don't know. Um, but yeah, that was that. And then, yeah, so for, the George Floyd uh, protests, like Black Lives Matter, um, the movement that's going on around the world. Um, I, I, I've always thought poetry is innately po uh, political. Um, I think if, uh, you know, your poetry doesn't ha have something to say, then what, well, what's the point, you know? Um, so I, I've, I've teamed up with a bunch of poets over the years as this collective called Poets for Peace, um, which uh, started in 2017. It's also like something that you know, anyone can, you know, make a sign and raise it high and say, I'm a poet for peace. It's not something that's hierarchical or like uh, centralized. It's like all about like the anarchy of like, let's all be poets for peace. Let's, let's uh, channel peace. Um, so actually today we, we actually released a zine, uh, which is a bunch of writing from uh, mostly black writers and uh, uh, writers of color who, uh, you know, have something to say and are just trying to share their experience as well as like, create a resource for advocacy. Um, and I think in my, own, in my own personal experience, I'm excited to be able to share this, this zine uh, because I think there's a lot of like division and discord. And I'm hoping like this little collection of like, you know, these personal poems that people have with their own experience of being, you know, non-white or non-straight um, non or, you know, just being a person, just being like, like you know, uh, completely like whoever they they are um i hope other people who read those stories are are able to experience like oh this isn't all about us versus them this is about us this is like this is what we all want we all want peace you know we all want to chill we want to relax we want to be able to like live and not struggle um and so yeah if you guys are interested that that zine is available uh today it came out um, and there's information on my Instagram about it. Um, all of the proceeds are going to uh, bail funds and uh, BIPOC or organizations around the country um, in support of the movement for Black Lives. And also it's a zine that's gonna be ongoing. And once we can all like meet, meet and rally together, there'll be also like a bunch of tours hopefully. So a bunch of poetry readings. Maybe we'll be going through uh, Winchester, Virginia when, when quarantine has all, you know, come to an end. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That It'll be wonderful to, to, to see you then. Um, and I wanna go around, so this will be our final question. We are gonna be wrapping up at uh, 8.30. So I believe it or not, we've kind of run a little bit over on time and we will not be able to do, um, I think, a request for poetry. But what I want to invite our attendees to do is to let, just drop a comment in. If you would like a poem from one of these poets, uh, you can, uh, the, I'm sure that our, uh, I don't know if our our poets can actually message back. Actually, yeah, our poets can actually directly chat you through the chat. So as, as we kind of continue going around on this final question, if you want to request a poem, drop it in the chat, mention who you'd like to get a poem from, and uh, the po other poets that aren't answering questions will be able to kind of commute with, communicate with you and get some um, personal information. Everybody that is on here um, will, will, can do a, a poem. Uh, we're not going to be doing any live poems today, but uh, it, please consider, make sure that when you ask a poet for a poem, ask them how you, they would like to be compensated. I know we were going a little bit back and forth in the chat earlier about um, the different ways that people put up their signs, what they tend to ask for poems. So 
uh, this is the way that these artists um, make, make a living and support themselves and continue to be able to create and support themselves in, um, in the public square. So thank you so much for anybody's, anybody and everybody's generosity and everybody's interest. Um, I see that uh, Matilda has dropped her email in the chat. So if anybody wants to drop any emails, um, Instagram handles, uh, you're more than welcome to put that in. Um, so um, I want to actually uh, go to you, Benjamin, uh, because uh, your work with the um, uh, Democratic Socialist Party of America, um, a, you talked a little bit, I watched a live stream of you with the, um, uh, with, with the bookstore that was, I guess it was New Orleans bookstore. It was right after you got you and, and Sky had moved. Uh, talking a little bit about how it's a really interesting time um, to be uh, politically active as well as an artist in America. So share, share a little bit about what this has kind of been like for you the, the, the past couple of months creating. Yeah, it's been, it's been strange. It's been a strange trip. You know, um, it's funny as someone who has always created explicitly political art, um, there's like a fascinating phenomenon now where it's like, there's all these basically liberal artists like being like, capitalism is bad. It's, uh, you know, it's sort of like, uh, kind of a funny phenomenon. It's sort of like, yeah, welcome, welcome to, you know, like, we're glad you're, we're glad you're here, you know, although um, I distrust those liberal tendencies because it's, yeah, I worry it will just fade away so, so quickly um, that it's, it's uh, not really based in like a class struggle sort of thing. But um, it's exciting, you know, uh, as someone who writes explicitly political work, I'm, I'm hoping, uh, there's always a lag in like publishing, you know, but uh, like just because people are writing things right now, it will take, you know, a year or two for, for it to come out. But I'm hoping there will be more interest in explicitly political work, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so uh, I'll, I'll bounce quickly to Brian and then uh, Matilda. Um, so Brian, tell me a little bit, tell everybody a little bit, because I was there, um, a little bit about your, your typewriter parade. Uh, I think this was probably the best um, uh, characterization, as I could tell, of how you took uh, quarantine and really kind of grabbed it by the horns and, and turned it into something that was really beautiful and inspiring, um, Thanks. as much as the, the pandemic can be. Quarantine's been a trip. I've been working with students on poetry over Zoom for a lot of it, and that's been a piece of it. Um, I also had a book come out at the end of June, so I had the book launch, um, and as part of that did this typewriter parade um, where I invited folks with typewriters from uh, all over the country to come and show off their machines to each other and uh, write live poems in response to some of the essays that I read in the little interview, and we just had such an incredible time. and. Um, I think part of the potential of quarantine is to do things like this. I was originally planning to be out um, physically uh, with y'all um, as part of the book tour during this time. Um, but because of this, there's a shift, I think, and being able to really go deep into things. So what I'm working on planning right now is uh, an event series based around each chapter of the book because each context that I've written in becomes uh, a potential venue to bring people online and get to introduce them to people all over the world. Um, so I'm going to shut up now because I know we're at time and Matilda, I want to make sure you get a chance to speak. So I'm actually going to kind of jump in here. I am getting the, the hard hook. I'm going to give our, a little bit of a, of a conclusion and thank everybody. Thank you so much, everybody that has been um, in the chat and thank you everybody that has uh, been here and watching and, and discussing. Um, I, uh, it, it, it's, it was so much, so nice to kind of be here and to be able to share about street poetry, talk a little bit about what we've been learning as artists <clears throat> in a special time, uh, give hype to our typewriters and just celebrate what we do. Um, if again, anybody that is uh, attending, if you are interested in what we do, please follow um, these artists on Instagram, check out what that work looks like and request poetry. Uh, what I have learned from requesting from other poets is that uh, you, you get such a personable experience, um, really written for the heart, um, as well as very skilled wordplay. I see uh, our, our, some of our uh, poets are massaging and uh, showing off their typewriters. Thank you again, everybody, for tuning in. 
And everybody that's also tuned in, please consider donating to 1455. This is a wonderful organization that is creating a, a, an amazing um, writing space for artists in the community where I'm at. I can tell you that Winchester has inspired me and it will inspire many more people when they can do residencies at 1455. Thank you everybody for coming. Thank you so much for, for tuning in and thank you so